Good afternoon and welcome to Oster's webinar series, Brief the Board. Apologies for the short delay. I'm Eric Morgan. I'm an associate in Oster's litigation department in Toronto. This is the first in a series of webinars that Osler is presenting on how Council can brief their board members and senior management across a variety of litigation topics. In today's webinar, we will be discussing class actions. I'm joined today by Craig Lockwood, a litigation partner here at Osler with extensive experience in class proceedings, and Melissa Krishna, Deputy General Counsel for Special Projects at Pacific Exploration and Production. If you have any questions during the webinar, please email us or type them into the area provided on your screen and we'll respond to them as time permits. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig and Melissa. Great, thanks Eric. Um, so today we're going to give you uh, an overview of uh, effectively how to manage a class action. We won't be getting into the, the details of the class proceedings themselves, but rather the sort of business implications uh, when you're confronted with a class proceeding and how to manage your operations uh, through the sort of treacherous waters. Um, at the outset of a claim, the, the, the first and foremost, you have to assess the scope of the claim. And what that means is not only the nature and extent of the uh, sort of liability, but also the impact on the company, its operations, and also third parties. Uh, and so from that perspective, with respect to scope of the claim, the first question you have to determine is whether the issue, the underlying claim, is grounded in a historical event or whether it's an ongoing issue. And, and the reason that's fundamental is because if it's an ongoing issue, it may require active participation or intervention by the company uh, over and above the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, for example, if it involves uh, a product that's on the market, there may be a product recall required. Um, you may have to a point, for example, a special committee to deal with changes to ongoing business operations, uh, and you may have issues with respect to a regulator if you work in a regulated industry. Uh, and the other thing to, to concern yourself with is if there are multiple claims out there, and that's often the case, there will typically be multiple plaintiff's firms that commence a claim, you want to assess the scope of each claim to see if they're parallel. And just by way of example, in the, the Sino Forest class proceedings, there were three or four claims at the outset, and they were essentially the same, but they had somewhat different uh, class perspective, and also some of the claims were more nuanced, and that was with a view to sort of getting an, uh, an upper hand in the, in the ultimate carriage battle that took place. But it was important at the outset to sort of figure out exactly how all of the claims broke down and whether they, in fact, were parallel or, or whether some had some, as I say, nuanced differences. Uh, related to that, of course, is the size of the claim, and most importantly in that regard is whether the claim itself is going to trigger reporting obligations either to insurers, to regulators, or to shareholders more generally. Um, by their very nature, class actions sort of rise above a de minimis level, and so you'll almost certainly have some form of reporting obligations to, to either, as I say, the regulator or to the markets. And for reporting issuers and arguably others, the nature and the scope of the public disclosure needs to be assessed right at the outset. So, and uh, Craig, one of the ways that we use to assess the size of a potential claim would be to look at, look at our market cap if it's a public company. Uh, for example, Petro Magdalena Energy, which is a company that we acquired, um, there was an issue where potential production had been disclosed in our financial statements as actual production. And as a result, when we announced the correction, there was a resulting decline in the market cap of about 40%, which could be attributed to the incorrect disclosure to the market. Um, so you kind of, you know, get a sense of that could potentially be the class size if, if there are shareholders who purchased at the time that you announced the production and then, you know, shareholders as a result of that announcement um, lost out. So that's that's kind of gives you a, an idea of the size of uh, of the claim that, that could potentially arise. That's great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, related to that, of course, is also the jurisdictional bounding of the claim, um, both nationally and, and internationally. Very, very commonly, uh, Canadian class proceedings will, of course, be grounded on parallel U.S. proceedings. Um, and that's helpful insofar as that may give you some sort of indication as to where a proceeding is headed. Oftentimes the U.S. litigation is far more advanced than the Canadian proceedings. Um, they, they, they oftentimes can be contemporaneous, but, but it, if we get a little bit of lead time, 
you'll get a sense of how the courts are responding to the claims and where the strengths and weaknesses of the plaintiff's allegations are, so that will give you some guidance as to where you can expect the Canadian proceedings to go. Um, but, but more uh, sort of domestically, the issue is, are you dealing with a national class, are you dealing with uh, a provincial class, or are you dealing with some sort of hybrid where it crosses provincial boundaries but doesn't reach the level of, of a national class? Um, and oftentimes the other issue is, are you dealing with a spillover? For example, if it's a product, um, do you know at the outset where the products ended up? Oftentimes, for example, they'll cross the U.S. borders, and that's important because if you're dealing not only with parallel class proceedings, you're also going to then have to deal with multiple regulators. So at the outset, you're going to want to, to the extent possible, identify what jurisdictions are involved and what the scope of your exposure is on that front. Uh, and lastly, in terms of sort of your initial assessment of the claim, you want to figure out exactly what parties are involved. And that's not just the parties to the litigation, that's sort of the, the easiest thing to determine because they're, they're set out for you. But the question is, are there third parties implicated by these proceedings who are not party to the, to the actual proceedings and are not named? Um, and similarly, are there, are there co-defendants that, that have a relationship with your company? And what's the nature of that relationship? Uh, are there foreign affiliates who are implicated? For example, oftentimes uh, Canadian proceedings will name foreign U.S. parents or foreign parents as named parties. And then you have to get into the consideration of whether that foreign affiliate is going to be torn to the Canadian jurisdiction. And that's the decision you're going to want to make at the outset because before you can take any steps, you'll need to decide whether the foreign affiliate will be torn. Similarly, regulators will often be involved if you're in a regulated industry, obviously. There's going to be an ongoing dialogue with your regulator, both with respect to the proceedings, but also with respect to the underlying issue. And you're going to need to determine whether there's an adversity of interest. And, and uh, what I mean by that is, is there a potential, uh, as is often the case, that the regulator may actually be a third party to your proceeding? If, if for example, uh, Health Canada is, is not infrequently named as, as a third party um, where products are involved, and the question is, are you going to uh, create an adversity of interest with the regulator, and there are obviously strategic upsides and downsides to doing so. Um, you want to consider whether there are any indemnities or other third-party uh, agreements that are at play, and if so, are there notice provisions? For example, if you have an indemnity at play, oftentimes there's a time period by which you have to notify uh, the third party of a claim under the indemnity, and you're going to want to do that at the outset to make sure that there are no sort of implications going forward. And lastly, and, and I, I don't do this in order of importance at all, but there's also the question of insurers, and you have to consider the extent to which the company is going to uh, dialogue not only with the insurer, but also dialogue with counsel, and whether that's going to be controlled by the insurer or whether that will be controlled directly by the company itself. And Melissa, you've had some experience on that front, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, from the general counsel perspective, you're too... Uh, most important relationships during the process of a class action are probably going to be with your legal counsel and your insurer. So, um, you know, most companies, I think, will go through an insurance broker. Um, that's going to, they're going to be technically your saving grace once you start, because, you know, start getting into settlement negotiations and that. And essentially at the outset, what you want to ensure when you're actually, um, when you're actually purchasing a policy, uh, there are two different types of policies. There's uh, the insurer's duty to defend, which means that the insurer will get to choose counsel and essentially manage uh, the litigation. This is usually uh, the kind of policy that uh, private companies or smaller companies would purchase. Uh, generally, public companies tend to have insured's duty to defend, so that, that means that the company would uh, take charge of managing Managing the litigation, um, you know, essentially, uh, you would have your choice of counsel, and uh, it has to be approved by the insurer. But you generally get to um, control the litigation, um, you know, with, with required consents from the insurer. Um, so, uh, you know, from a public com company perspective, it's extremely useful to have uh, a, a, a bit more control over the litigation, your choice of counsel, and what have you. Um, we'll discuss this a little bit further um, later in the presentation. But that's, that's outset good to know great thanks Melissa. Um, so sort of having assessed the 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 claim itself sort of in terms of its its implications for the business operations uh, the question we most often get is what what do you need to do 
as soon as you're confronted with a statement of claim, what are your first steps? Um, and although this may sound like self-interest, um, your, your first step should be to retain counsel. Um, the, the sooner that they're integrated into sort of the chain of communications, uh, the better, because they're going to be more effective as your counsel if they're sort of integrated into the company and they know sort of not only the, the legal implications of the claim, but also sort of the considerations you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then, of course, the next step is to sort of get your head around the underlying allegations. You need to assess pretty quickly the nature and extent of your exposure and whether there is, in fact, uh, you know, a, a valid issue here that needs to be resolved. Um, that may involve, for example, an internal investigation. As I mentioned, you may need to uh, strike a special committee. Uh, you may need to dialogue with regulators. Um, and then there are more sort of abstract concepts. For example, do you need to go out and retain experts to go and do product testing with the product? Um, do you need to engage PR firms? Because obviously any class action is going to be the subject of, of press coverage and it's going to have implications for the company's goodwill and its business reputation. Uh, and Melissa, maybe you can speak to the sort of PR issues that, that you folks faced. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, going back to your point about retaining counsel, I would say uh, it's it's wise from um, from the from internal counsel's perspective to have with your board already identified um, a slate of litigation counsel that's acceptable to the board um, in these scenarios. And it's 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 just a another preparedness. Um, tip, I guess you could say, where you would have a pre-approved slate of litigation counsel, and to that counsel you would provide also, um, every insurer has litigation guidelines, um, so you would have you would provide that to each litigation counsel to make sure that they can comply with those guidelines. Um, as an example, we were using a law firm out of Colombia, South America, and you know they were billing us on a flat rate fee, which was not acceptable to our insurer, so they prefer hourly billing so that they can track, you know, exactly the number of hours spent and what have you. So it's just, it's important, you know, um, if you already have that lined up, because you're going to have to react quickly when you're hit with a class action. So if you know you have a slate of litigation counsel who are pre-approved by your board, as well as acceptable to your insurer, um, you can just, you know, um, rely on that list. And then in terms of uh, getting back to the point with PR firms and investor relations issues, so if, you, if you're in a position where, you know, when you're hit with a class action, it, your stock price definitely will take a beating and you have to manage the reputational like the image of the company. So a PR firm can be really handy in doing that. Um, you, you know, in, in our case, we had our PR firm uh, analyze our press release announcing that we'd been hit with a class action and how you want to frame the messaging, um, that becomes pretty important. Uh, if your company has an investor relations department, then, you know, they will probably manage all of the calls from shareholders and um, et cetera. But if you don't, which in our case we didn't have, uh, then those calls are going to come to the GC's office and you're going to have to, you know, learn how to manage that. We'll talk a little bit more um, a little later about, um, you know, potential training that PR firms offer um, to handle these kinds of issues. Great. Thanks, Melissa. And I guess the third step, although it, it doesn't really lie along a continuum, it, but it's more contemporaneous with the fact-finding, is, is the issue of documents, because obviously uh, any litigation is going to turn on the documentary records, and you want to make sure that the appropriate mechanisms are in place, The litigation hold letters go out, that the custodians are identified and flagged, and that you have a robust document collection and protection sort of structure in place so that you can ensure that if at a later date there's any allegation as to, you know, records retention, et cetera, you can defensively tell the court that you took the necessary steps. Um, and related to that, of course, is, is the, the existence of a, uh, sort of an ongoing document retention policy outside the context of litigation. And Melissa, I know you've had some experience on that front. Yeah, so I mean, generally, it's a it's a good idea. It's a good corporate governance practice to have a document retention policy in place. Um, I know in creating ours, uh, which is currently still in draft, we're we're basically you know there is a lot of uh, research that goes into creating a document retention policy because various acts, whether it's the Income Tax Act or you know depending on who your regulator is, will rec will have certain um, periods of time for which you have to retain records. So that's that's you know your general document retention policy but then to put yourself in a defensible position like Craig was saying what's important to do is the minute you're hit with a class action is to send out a company-wide notice 
to all employees, um, advising them that they're not to delete any emails or, you know, discard of any documentation from that point going forward. So that's that's a pretty uh, key step that you're going to have to take to uh, ensure that, you know, there's uh, there's no issues later on in the process. Great, thanks. Now, obviously, the, the nature and extent of exposure turns on sort of the, the legal claim itself. Um, so it's going to be important early on to work with your counsel, external and internal, to assess sort of the merits of the claim, as it were. And, and related to that is whether there are any procedural or other motions or, or mechanisms you want to invoke uh, with a view to sort of either limiting your exposure or removing yourself from the jurisdiction or removing the claim from the jurisdiction. So at the outset, obviously, you're going to want to assess um, good facts, bad facts, the extent of any defenses that may be available to you, uh, but also are there any preliminary challenges that you might have uh, available to you? For example, uh, is there a form nonconvenience motion you could bring uh, arguing that Canada is not the right jurisdiction or, for example, for Ontario is not the right jurisdiction and rather it should be in another provincial court or a foreign court. Um, similarly, are there other procedural challenges such related to, for example, service? Are there pleadings deficiencies? All of those things need to be assessed uh, up front and that's another reason why you want to have your counsel in place because those will have sort of a, a, a f effect as they sort of filter down to the other considerations that you're, that you're playing with as, as these things play out. Part of that, the assessment of the claim, of course, is, is you want to assess the plaintiff's position. And um, it, it comes as no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, on, on, in this presentation that oftentimes class actions are, are driven by counsel. Um, and one of the things you want to assess is what's the strength of the underlying claim and and how far uh, are, the, are the plaintiffs or plaintiffs' counsel, as the case may be, willing to push a particular claim? Um, one of the things that's very instructive in that regard is, is whether there's a presence of a third-party funding body uh, in the background. And they're becoming more prolific now. Um, and I can tell you, we've, we've spoken with them, and they do a lot of upfront work before they agree to fund plaintiffs' counsel and they will do a very rigorous assessment of the merits. And so one thing that you want to be mindful of is if a plaintiff is in receipt of third-party funding by a third-party funding entity, um, you can be fairly assured that the claim itself at least has ostensible merits. Um, and you're going to want to at least take that into consideration when you're briefing the board. Uh, the other thing to consider really is, is who are you dealing with on the other side? Is it a single plaintiff's firm? Uh, is it are there multiple firms in different jurisdictions? Uh, is there a consortium? That's that's very common these days. You'll often see uh, uh, plaintiffs firms grouping together to bring a singular claim, either at the outset or oftentimes they'll start multiple competing claims and sort of agree to pursue the, the claims together. Um, but related to that is is there going to be a carriage motion? Um, and what that is is effectively a motion before the courts to determine which of the plaintiff's firms uh, should be granted carriage of the class action going forward because obviously the court wants to limit the, the specter of competing claims and, and the expenditure of needless judicial resources. So the, the very fact of a, of a carriage motion is important because it's going to obviously have a bearing upon the, the direction of the litigation as it goes forward and who's going to be sort of at the helm. Uh, and related to that, of course, is you, you want to consider the nature of the relationship with plaintiff's counsel. I mean, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a fairly small bar in Canada, and for the most part, plaintiff's firms and, and uh, you know, large class action firms on the defense side, they know each other, and oftentimes you can leverage a relationship, um, not so much with respect to the merits of the claim or the ultimate disposition of the claim, but rather with review to sort of agreeing at the outset what a reasonable schedule is going to be, how the procedures are going to be managed, and if, if there's a sort of a dialogue between defense counsel and plaintiff's counsel at the outset, oftentimes that can take some of the stress off the company of, of the unknown. And, of course, part of your sort of overall assessment of the claim, as we mentioned, relates to public disclosure obligations. And maybe, Melissa, you can give us some, your thoughts on, on that aspect of the assessment. Um, 
Sure. So um, as a public company, there are obviously disclosure reporting obligations. Um, and generally, it, you know, you're required to disclose any material information and materiality is, um, is at the discretion of the company. However, most class actions, just due to their potential size, will uh, generally meet the materiality threshold for a public company. Um, and therefore, it would be material information requiring disclosure under the securities legislation. So, uh, but the one thing that, like I mentioned before, that you could, um, you know, because it will be very important how you, uh, how you uh, convey the message. And so an important um, role player in that would be your PR firm or, you know, if you're able to get some consulting on uh, to that effect, that, that really is helpful in uh, delivering the message and, you know, trying to put not too much of a negative spin on it. Thanks, Melissa. And then related to that, of course, is whether if you're in a, a regulated industry, you have additional reporting obligations to regulators. So this is not uh, public disclosure reporting obligations, but rather, for example, uh, if you're in dealing with a product or a health product, Health Canada has requirements in terms of adverse event reporting and the sorts of things, uh, the CFIA, uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency may be involved. Similarly, financial regulators may be involved. So you have to consider not only sort of your public disclosures to the, to the market at large, but also whether there's an ongoing dialogue or reporting obligations under the governing uh, regulatory regime. So sort of having assessed the claim from a, from a business perspective and also from a, a legal perspective, the question then comes, what sort of strategic litigation steps do you need to take at the outset? Um, and oftentimes, some of these early decisions will have uh, implications later on down the line. So you're going to want to assess these as early as possible. And, and the landscape can change, obviously. But um, for example, if there are co-defendants involved, are you going to want to enter into a joint defense agreement? Um, and obviously, each case stands on its merits, and, and there may be good reasons for doing so and good reasons for not doing so in each case. But it's at least something you want to consider, because oftentimes it, it, it doesn't pay to, to fight a war on multiple fronts. And if you're engaged in cross-claiming against one another, it can sort of detract from your joint defense of the, the underlying claim. Uh, likewise, and perhaps more importantly, are there third parties who are not presently at the table that you need to bring to the table? Are there um, for suppliers, for example, or people who, who you have indemnification rights uh, in respect of that you want a third party and bring into the action? Because if so, you want to do that at an early stage and get them at the table as soon as possible. Um, another question that often comes up is the timing of defenses. Um, historically, the tr traditional model has been that you don't file a substantive defense uh, to a claim until after certification. Uh, in recent years, a couple of decisions from Justice Perel, for example, have sort of pushed against the grain in that regard. And now, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily the, the, the unwritten rule anymore, but it's still a, a strategic consideration you want to uh, sort of assess at the outset, which is the do you want to defend and put your position on the record at an early stage, or do you want to wait until after the certification decision, if, if that's an option, uh, and deal with it at that stage? And then lastly, the issue of expert retention often comes into play. Um, and th this, is, this comes up in, in sort of a multiple, uh, on, on multiple fronts. First, just the very fact of retaining an expert who's going to assess the merits of the claim and help you navigate the claim is often important. But, on a more strategic level, oftentimes, especially when you're dealing with a discrete industry or a discrete product, for example, um, there's a limited number of experts who are available to opine on certain issues. And it will be important to tie those experts up or to at least retain them early on in the process so that you don't get conflicted out. And I know that uh, we've, we've had a number of instances where plaintiff's firm in advance of filing a claim will have gone out and actually retained experts with a view to conflicting them out of the defendant's uh, sort of pockets. So you're going to want to assess very early on, do you need expert assistance? And if so, uh, from whom? And you want to reach out to them as soon as possible to make sure that you can get the expert you want and the expert you need in a particular context.
Yeah, and to Craig's point, like, um, you know, I couldn't agree more on the expert retention because even if you do, um, you know, get certified and you, like, if you, if you end up at a point of where you're just having settlement negotiations, experts can play a role then as well because, you know, your insurer will want to retain an expert to assess the size of the settlement or what the, what the potential, uh, you know, what you can, tie to the to the wrongful disclosure or what have you uh, how much of the um, size of the claim can be tied to that wrongful disclosure and there you you'd get experts to come and weigh in so it, it's if you are or if you've retained experts early on then you're, you're covered throughout the settlement process as well that's a great point thanks Melissa so just I mean this is by way of recap but effectively you've got two contemporaneous streams of action or analysis ongoing. On the one hand, you want to assess the, the claim itself and its implications for the business, the nature and extent of your exposure. And on the other hand, you want to work with your counsel to sort of make the strategic litigation decisions that are at play. Uh, and the one thing I, I should have mentioned, of course, is you want to always be mindful of limitation periods, uh, particularly, for example, with respect to third-party claims. Uh, and that's another reason why you want to get out ahead of this as soon as possible, because the last thing you want to do is find out that, um, you know, rights you may have had against a third party uh, have expired due to the expiry of a limitation period, and that, that you're left holding the bag. So uh, we, we don't propose to get into the, the, the details of a certification hearing and, and what's entailed, but it is important to know that at the outset, the certification motion... Um, is sort of a huge hurdle in, in the in the sort of continuum of, of proceedings, and it really is can be dispositive of the litigation, even though there's no actual assessment of the merits. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, if, if a class is not certified, oftentimes that's the end of the story because it doesn't financially make sense for plaintiffs to pursue it on an individual basis. Uh, likewise, if a class is certified, it's oftentimes when, when cases will settle because the degree and magnitude of exposure is crystallized now and, and uh, defendants are often sort of in a, in a settlement mindset rather than proceeding to the merits. Um, but from a, from a briefing the board perspective, the first thing you want to do is sort of explain to the board what a certification motion is and why it is significant because it's, it's obviously not going to be intuitive to non-lawyers and, frankly, even some lawyers who haven't had experience in the class actions context won't be familiar with sort of the, the, the details of a certification motion and why, why it really matters. Um, again, without going into the details of, of how they play out, really there are sort of three outcomes of a certification motion. And the most obvious one is the class gets certified. And what that means is effectively... The, the either some version of the class or, or the class itself as it initially articulated is now certified as a class proceeding to go forward. Uh, and as mentioned, that's going to have huge settlement implications one way or the other. Um, alternatively, certification can be dismissed. And as I said, that's oftentimes the end of the story because uh, plaintiff's counsel oftentimes will be doing this on a contingency fee basis. Uh, and if, if they lose the ability to aggregate claims, they similarly lose the economic incentives to pursue a claim. Uh, and lastly, uh, you could get a modified class certified, which is the plaintiffs will articulate a particular class in their pleading, but ultimately the court decides that a smaller or different class is, is which should be uh, certified. Um, interestingly, that can be hugely impactful. And, if you look at some of the recent securities class actions, that's really where it's played out. For example, uh, recently the, the Ontario courts have taken the view that they will only certify classes um, of securities where the exchanges, uh, where the purchasers bought on a Canadian exchange. So, for example, the TMX, but they won't certify uh, classes of purchasers who bought on a foreign exchange. And there have been a couple of class actions recently where they tried to certify uh, a class of all purchasers of a particular security, and the class was modified to a much, much smaller class of just the TMX purchasers, and the result was effectively a, an abandonment of the claim because, again, the economic incentives are lost once a class gets decimated down to, you know, 5% of what it initially it was articulated at. And then the, the, the sort of asterisk to all of this is you, you may ultimately face a, a certification but in a different form and what this means is 
you could have a situation where a court declines to certify a class action but does so on the basis that a more appropriate forum is, is where the litigation should play out. So oftentimes you'll see competing claims in various provincial jurisdictions and a court will either stay a claim or uh, decline to certify on the basis that the other provincial jurisdiction or another national class in another jurisdiction is, is the more appropriate forum. Uh, and just from a from a sort of more pragmatic perspective, the the certification motion it's it's a bit of a misnomer to call it a, a motion given its significance, although that's technically what it is. But the reason it's important from a business operations perspective is it is going to be the subject of significant media scrutiny. It is going to be sort of the lightning rod for everything going forward, and it's a huge turning point in the lifespan of a piece of litigation, class action litigation. Um, it's also going to generate a lot of public attention in the sense that there, were, if it's certified, there's going to be notices to the class. There's going to be opt-out periods. There are a lot of public communication around a certification hearing. So even though there is ironically no assessment of the merits, it's going to be the one time where, frankly, most of the discussion about the merits and about the nature of the litigation sort of arises. Now, the question that then arises is, if a class is certified, what next? Um, and as mentioned, settlement is often what's next because it just the order of magnitude is such that oftentimes uh, defendants are, are minded to structure some sort of settlement. But it doesn't always happen immediately. In fact, it rarely happens immediately. And the, the lifespan of a, a class action proceeding is, is extremely long. Uh, and companies need to be mindful of that. They, they, it may be that you're living in the shadow of a class action for many years uh, before it gets resolved. Um, and it's also important to remember that, there's, frankly, in the common law jurisdictions, only been a handful of class actions that have ever gone to a trial on the merits. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say that, that settlement is, is usually the outcome in the post-certification world. But that can happen at any point. That can happen either immediately following certification, but more commonly, um, for example, during the discovery phase, uh, in the context of preliminary motions, or, or even after exchanges of expert reports. There's, there's, a, there's a continuum, and, and as you get closer and closer to the trial on the merits, uh, the parties' positions become more crystallized, and therefore settlement becomes more of a, more of a tangible goal for, for the parties. Um, and oftentimes, again, going back to the point I made earlier, these class proceedings are, are typically uh, council-driven, and so the prospects of settlement and the likely outcome of a settlement are going to be driven by council, but we have to remember that um, all settlements are subject to court approval once, once a class is certified under the Class Proceedings Act, and so it's not going to be simply a matter of, of negotiating with the plaintiff's counsel, but you'll also need ultimate court approval. Uh, and Melissa, you've you had some experience on that front as well, so maybe you could just comment on that briefly. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more that once the class is certified, um, it definitely changes the focus to settlement, um, and it's definitely in the company's interest to try to get the class action settled. Um, in our case, for example, um, the class action arose in 2011, and we didn't get the settlement uh, agreement approved by the court until December 2013. So it's definitely a very uh, long period of time. You have, uh, and this is because of the multitude of parties involved. You've got, obviously, the counsel from both sides. You've got your several, so in our case, we had several layers of insurance. So you've got each of those insurers being represented. So and their counsel, and then you've got your broker. So it's a number of parties that need to get together to have these settlement discussions. Um, you know, calendars, working out all of these different people's calendars can also set the time back. And uh, and then you've got, you know, in our case, we had experts come in to determine the scope uh, of the settlement. Um, and like I said, what, you know, how much of the um, loss in market cap could be tied to um, essentially the inaccurate dis disclosure. So there are a number of parties that get involved, and so the matter does drag on uh, for an uh, you know extended period of time. One of the ways that I think GCs can help move things along is um, as soon as the class is certified, you can essentially approach your board because at this time you've 
uh, you should have a handle on the potential size of the claim. Um, so you can approach your board and you know ask for a pre-approved range of settlement amount, um, something that the board can live with so that during settlement negotiations, you're not having to go back to the board to seek approval each time. So um, in preparing for a class action before it happens, what can you as GC do? So this is even before you're hit with a class action, how can you make sure that you're putting your company in the best position to, um, to face that challenge? So, um, you know, obviously what's going to be relied on in, uh, in the settlement uh, is going to be your insurance, your directors and officers insurance. So one of the one things you have to look at um, and one of the things that the board will rely on you to provide advice on is at the limits of the coverage, like how much coverage should the board be seeking. So again, one of the ways would be to look at your market cap and potentially how much movement there might be in the market cap as a result of you know, any sort of inaccurate disclosure. Going back to the Petra Magdalena example from before, um, if your market cap is 100 million and your market cap moves by 40% as a result of your inaccurate disclosure, um, based on you know general settlement ranges, like we settled at about 20% of the 40 million, so it was 8 million, um, and then you add to that your defense costs, uh, let's say it's 4.5 million, so you're looking at a limit of about 12.5 million. Again, to look at you know what defense costs um, are generally, there is there are insurer stats available, so you can look at those statistics. For example, from 2002 to 2012, Chubb Insurance was involved in 26 of 30 Canadian securities claims. So that's a pretty, uh, you know, significant number. So you can rely on on them. They incurred 36 million in defense costs, with an average of four and a half million of defense costs and eight and a half million in settlement amounts per suit. So that's a good sort of, um, you know, that gives you a general idea of uh, of what you might be looking at for um, limits of coverage. The other way, the other thing you can look at is look at peer group benchmarking. So just see what other uh, companies in your industry are doing. For example, uh, Jones Brown, who's our insurance broker, um, they have a number of public company clients, and so they looked at a number of public company clients across various industries and identified a general trend for us, which is essentially for every twenty million dollars, twenty million dollars in assets, clients tend to carry approximately a million dollars in, in um, DNO coverage for each. 20 million assets. So, you know, there are a number of ways to determine um, the limits of coverage. And again, ultimately, it's going to be your board that's going to decide how much coverage they're comfortable with having. Uh, but when they rely on you for advice on that, um, there are a number of uh, guidelines available. The other thing to consider is when you're picking, you know, your insurance policy or you're, you're identifying which insurer you're going to work with, um, it's it's very prudent to look at their claims response process. So again, um, like I mentioned before, you would um, understand who has the duty to defend. So you know, it, it's always better if the company can can you know choose counsel and manage the litigation. So that's advantageous for you. Um, then you would look at where the claims authority resides. So by this, I actually mean locally. Like, do you, are they is the claims authority resident you know in Canada easily accessible? or there are certain insurers that where they've got you know their claims authority residing in New York or London this just logistically poses challenges so it, it, if you are able to access them access the claims authority locally it'll just help move processes along a lot quicker um, finally you want to have met the claims team and understood their approach to claims management so there are a variety of you know it, again it, this will this is where your insurance broker will have a role to play in bringing you together and liaising um, with your insurers so that you do have a good handle on how they manage claims processes. Um, another consideration would be to look at the scope of coverage. This becomes quite key because um, the trend has been that DNO coverage has become extremely broad and generally will cover past, present, and future directors and officers, um, the corporate entity itself, employees as co-defendants, um, subsidiaries and sometimes outside entities. So it's possible that your entire limit available for DNOs could be completely eroded by, let's say, a securities claim against the corporate entity itself. 
Um, so how would you, how do you advise your board in terms of how individual directors and officers should be protected? Um, there is a product out there called Excess Side A DIC Coverage. DIC stands for difference in conditions. So this type of insurance essentially kicks in if for some reason um, the indemnity agreements provided to the directors and officers is not um, able to be put in put into effect. Like basically, if you if directors and officers are not able to enforce their indemnity agreements, let's say because the company has claimed bankruptcy or there are other legal reasons why the company is not able to indemnify directors and officers, this type of insurance would then kick in. Um, so, and the, the benefit of having this type of insurance um, and the difference in conditions is that your primary DNO policy generally has a lot of exclusions. Um, for example, for um, you know pollution cleanup costs, like that would be an exclusion under a primary policy, where an ex a good excess side A DIC policy would have very few exclusions. Um, so like, you know, for example, in the case of, uh, in the North Star case, where the Ministry of Environment held the directors personally liable for cleanup costs due to pollution, the company had filed for bankruptcy protection and it did not have environmental insurance. So at the time of this case, um, excess side DIC coverage was not a widely offered product, and so and and they didn't have it. Um, but again, this is where your insurance broker can play a key role, where they would advise you on the trends in the insurance industry, make sure that you are keeping up, keeping your DNO program updated, um, uh, and make sure that the you know appropriate coverage has been added. Okay. So now we'll move to uh, what you can do as GC for when you are actually hit with the class action. So you would immediately debrief the board, uh, basically get in front of them, explain to them the scope, the potential size, and the liability faced by the business. You would understand the limits, you know, basically with pre-approved counsel and settlements, you can easily move forward with, um, you know, discussions with your counsel and insurance brokers. Um, another good idea is to introduce external counsel to your board so that they get comfortable. External counsel will be best positioned in explaining to them, you know, the class action proceedings as Craig has clearly demonstrated. So uh, it's best if you can introduce your external counsel to your board and get them comfortable. Um, and then frequent and consistent communication with your board will be key because obviously it's, um, you know, it puts everyone in a nervous and an un uncomfortable position. So we did biweekly updates to the board um, just to let them know how things were going along. If you're not able to get the board together for a meeting, you can certainly do so by email. Um, the last point was we had touched on PR training. So it's, um, there will be a lot of tension within the organization. So it's important to appoint spokespersons within the company who are responsible for delivering messages to anybody outside the corporation. If your company attracts a lot of media attention, this will become very key. Um, and so you want to get a couple of people trained, um, you know, by PR companies on how to respond to media inquiries. Um, finally, just ensure that your employees also know that for, in our case, we sent out a notice to employees pretty much simultaneously with the press release going out, letting them know that they are not to discuss anything with, about the class action with anybody outside of the company. They should direct whoever approaches them to the appointed spokesperson. Um, so that, you know, just ensures that you keep it, keep a tight lid on, on how um, the class action gets framed in the media. That's great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so lastly, and we're mindful of the time, but we just want to briefly touch on uh, sort of the practical implications of managing a business that, that sort of lives in the shadow of a class action. As mentioned, the time horizon on, on these proceedings can be extremely extensive. And so you, you may have to sort of continue on with your daily operations under the cloud of a class action in the background for a number of years. Um, the first thing, obviously, you want to do is uh, internally you want to assess your your financial reporting obligations. Do you need to take a reserve, for example? Um, as Melissa mentioned, you're going to want to make sure that you have uh, a process in place for internal communications with employees, um, both informing them as to sort of the status of the lit litigation as it unfolds, but also ensuring that, that their dealings with third parties and the public uh, are properly controlled. Um, for, for multinational entities, you're going to want to give some consideration to implications for foreign affiliates, for example. Um, oftentimes, this, this comes up in the context of settlement because 
Uh, if a proceeding is settled in one jurisdiction, it's very frequent that you'll see a copycat proceeding start up in a fresh jurisdiction against a foreign affiliate on the same basic facts. And so oftentimes when entering into a potential settlement, one of the concerns that comes up is what, what is this going to mean for the global industry? Are we going to see a series of claims following on the heels of this because we've effectively uh, paid the plaintiffs in this jurisdiction? Um, and then lastly, there's the issue of, of insurance costs. And maybe, Melissa, you can just briefly speak to that. Yeah, just basically, if you're hit with a class action and then you're looking to renew your insurance policy, it's more than likely that it will cost you more uh, to renew your insurance. So just uh, just a note to say, you know, you want to budget for that and, and note to your finance team that there might be an increase in that cost. And then finally, you're, you're also going to want to obviously consider your external relations as the class action unfolds. Um, one of the complicating factors is oftentimes class members may in fact be uh, sort of a counterparty to uh, agreements. For example, in the franchise context, the, the class members themselves are people with whom you're dealing on a daily basis, and that can be very complicated. And there are a number of decisions out there that sort of uh, attempt to sort of delineate the nature uh, and extent of permissible communications um, about the litigation in the context of ongoing business operations. Similarly, if you've got shareholders, uh, you're going to have to consider communications with shareholders about the uh, proceedings as they unfold. Uh, and, and similarly, clients, customers, third-party suppliers, all of these uh, sort of constituents are going to need to take into consideration Obviously, the biggest concern for the company, or typically the biggest concern, is going to be the impact on the goodwill of the company as it goes forward, reputational impact of the proceedings, and that will need to be tightly managed, again, as, as Melissa mentioned. That's why PR firms are often engaged in this context. And then, as we've also mentioned, uh, sort of the ongoing relationship with the regulator, uh, Health Canada, um, financial regulators, et cetera, you're obviously going to want to maintain a good relationship to the extent possible, and so you'll need to manage that almost on a daily basis sometimes um, as these class proceedings unfold. So subject to, to any questions, that, that's pretty much what we wanted to cover today. Thanks very much, Craig and Melissa. So I think we've got a couple of follow-up questions. I'm mindful of the time, though. Uh, one of them was, uh, how do you find out if a claim is being funded by a third party, and who are the big funders? Um, that's a great question. So, so ever since uh, 2011, I guess, it was, it, the, the Dougal and Manulife case was the first to sort of actually acknowledge that third-party funders were not champertous and therefore were permissible sort of within the Canadian landscape. Uh, and then there was the Kinross decision by Perel thereafter. Um, the funding issues have been sort of uh, regulated in the sense that there is now an obligation on the part of plaintiffs to disclose uh, the nature of the third-party funding relationship, uh, and they actually need to seek court approval. So it will be a public process in the sense that it's it's not something theoretically that can happen behind the scenes. They actually have to actively disclose to the court and seek court approval, uh, and the court will scrutinize them fairly uh, rigorously. Uh, in terms of who the third-party funders are. There are a number of them out there. Oftentimes they're international and will still fund within Canada, but uh, Bentham Canada is one that is sort of, it's an international entity, but it has recently made inroads in Canada, uh, and, and you're seeing them come up quite frequently. So again, the, the importance of all of this is, as I say, is really that if they're involved, um, you can be fairly assured that some heavy degree of assessment of the merits has taken place because obviously they're in it as a financial investment and they, they tend not to invest in, in what they deem to be frivolous lawsuits. Thanks, Craig. Melissa, I'm just wondering if you can talk briefly about your experience about how long the process lasts, which may be a question that board members and senior management might have. Yeah, so based on my experience, I mean, like I said, um, ours lasted over two years. So um, it's, you know, it, like, there are ways to shorten up the process and tighten it up and it's just it's all of the tips that we've provided you on ter in terms of how to be prepared and just have pre-approved litigation counsel you know pre-approved settlement amounts so this kind of thing can shorten that uh, time frame but as Craig mentioned I mean they can drag on for years so um, you can give them a general idea but I think it's uh, it's difficult to predict but uh, if it goes over a couple of years I don't think that's um, unlikely
Great, thanks very much. So on behalf of Melissa and Craig, thank you for joining us for this webinar. We hope it's given you some useful insights. A copy of the slides as well as a one-pager of takeaways will be sent to you uh, as a PDF after this. You can also find more information and commentary on class actions and risk management on Osler's blogs. A copy of Osler's white paper on class actions is available from osler.com. Uh, we hope we join you. Um, you'll join us for the next webinar, which will focus on arbitration. Thank you again for attending this webinar, and have a good day.